why is it that every time a cat knocks slash scratches on the door and you open it, they just stare at you? Like, are you coming in or are you coming out? Uh, if you're a cat owner, you know what I'm talking about. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to Consuming Crime with Jenna and Jules. It is Jules here. Today, we are continuing to cover American Detective with Joe Kenda. Now we are on episode four. Um, this episode is called... Hold on one sec. From the Deep. This show can be found on Discovery Plus, which I highly recommend. Uh, not only because it has really good true crime documentaries, but also because they have a, like every episode of 90 Day Fiance, you can imagine. 90 Day Bears All... 90 day single life, the regular 90 day, happily ever after, pillow talk, just what what now, like you guys can, it's very clear that uh, I watch this a lot, and no I'm not sponsored by Discovery Plus, uh, but I should be. Before we get started, make sure you give us five stars wherever you are listening, and make a note that we are no longer on the Patreon, I have paused um, on making extra episodes for that just for the time being because of the workload it does take a lot to edit and post that many episodes another thing make sure you check out our sponsor audible currently i'm still listening to actually i haven't listened to it in since last episode but i was in the middle of he's lying sis which is a book about men that lie which could also apply to women obviously everybody can lie and it just tells you like common phrases that is used in the dating world that you should kind of look out for but again you get two free credits on us if you go to audibletrial.com slash consuming crime again that is audibletrial.com slash consuming crime hopefully next week i'm reading a new book that i can tell you guys about or listening to a new book without further ado let's get into today's case on october 9th 2003 in cape may new jersey a couple was taking their new boat out for a ride on the ocean the atlantic ocean when they stumble across what looks like just a floating object and at first they're thinking okay maybe it's just a bunch of garbage maybe it's a bunch of fish maybe it's a big fish because when you're out in the ocean you don't think you're gonna see anything evil out of the ordinary i should say as they get closer they realize it is a human body a female to be more specific this was almost three and a half miles out into the ocean so and she was also fully clothed at least that's how they showed it in the dramatization so I don't think she was swimming out there and got lost. She wasn't exactly dressed for a swim. The documentary is interviewing Steve Brown, who was a lieutenant. The documentary is interviewing a Stephen Brown, who was a lieutenant, lieutenant, lieutenant. That's like the third time I've done this take. Stephen Brown was a lieutenant of the New Jersey State Police for 25 years, and at the time he was running the crime scene unit. Just kidding, that's Jim Thistle. I skipped a line. Sorry, go back. <laughs> Stephen Brown was a lieutenant with the New Jersey State Police, and he was a trooper for over 21 years when the case came in. He had only been a detective at that time for maybe a month. Jim Thistle, this is the guy, he worked for the New Jersey State Police for 25 years, and at the time he ran the crime scene unit. He is now retired. The decomposition was already starting to show... And like I said, this was a female, but she was unrecognizable. The reason for this is this is going to get kind of dark really quick, so trigger warning, guys. The small fish in the ocean attack the soft tissue first, which would be things like the lips, the eyes, and the ears. So that's why she was unrecognizable. She also had a rock crab on her inner thigh, which indicated that at one point she did sink to the bottom because I guess the rock crabs are bottom feeders. There was a large metal chain wrapped around her feet. This definitely was not an accident and now we're looking at a homicide investigation whoever did this figured the chains would make her sink and they were obviously wrong now we're at the autopsy the medical examiner is saying that she had several fractures at the base of the skull this was indicative that she had suffered blunt force trauma from either a large object or a five-story fall into open water so she would have to be on like a cruise ship and pushed off or in like an airplane, something like that. They were not able to determine if she was deceased before or after hitting the water. After this, they tried getting fingerprints, but it was really difficult because water wrinkles the skin. So what they ended up doing, which is smart and I didn't think about it, is they injected water into her finger to make the finger puff up and make the fingerprints easier to register. 
after submitting fingerprints into their database or whatever it is that they do, they were able to match it with a girl by the name of Kimberly Holton and she is or was 16 years old. She was a foster child in Delaware. The documentary is interviewing a woman by the name of Destiny Andrews. This woman was Kim's best friend. They met in sophomore year of high school and they were together every single day since the day that they met. That's what she said. That's what Destiny said, not that's what she said. You guys got that though. Destiny says that she loved animals. She would watch the Animal Channel and read animal magazines all the time. She was also a very sweet girl. I think everyone that loves animals is sweet. No, that's not true. No, I take that back. Kimberly was reported missing by her foster mother, who had last seen her on September 29th. New Jersey State Police and Delaware State Police joined forces to figure out what happened to Kimberly. They find an address for her in Dover, Delaware. This was an active address, and this is where Ronald and Laura Michaels resided, her foster parents. First, they needed to contact the mother. They needed to tell her, hey, we found your daughter. So that's what they do. And detectives describe her as very distraught. She was very upset. Clearly, she did not see this coming. She accounted that Kimberly would run away kind of all the time, but she would only ever leave for like two or three days, and she would always come back. And this was the one time that she just never came back. They asked Laura about Kim's background. Kim had a difficult life before being adopted by them. Her father was a criminal and her biological mother had substance abuse issues, so Kim would spend most of her time with her grandfather in Delaware. Her grandfather would make her do chores around the house, basically giving her responsibility, trying to teach her what it was like to be an adult, and Kimberly did not like this. So in the same trailer hood area, trailer park area that's where she met heather and her and heather became very very close to the point where heather's mother which is laura the woman that we're speaking to right now adopted her as her legal guardian i'm not entirely sure that that would be the same as her being her foster child um, but that's the way they're describing it so let's just go with that the documentary is now interviewing heather the sister She's saying, we bonded, it was just easy with her. We did sisterly things, we dressed the same and everything. She was a really happy girl and she was super good with people. So, like, I mean, that seems really cool. Like, this is your best friend and now she's your sister. That's kind of dope, actually. As far as it seemed, Kim really liked being there. That's what the detectives say, which I have to disagree because if she really liked being there, why is she running away so much? Something's wrong with that. They bring Laura into the station to conduct their interview even further, and the guy says, or the detective says, take me through it. This is what she says verbatim. I went and checked on her in the evening, whether it was 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock, whatever time it was. She was asleep. Which is, like, she was super defensive. I don't know if I captured that very well. I'm not exactly an actress. But she was really defensive, and she even seemed a little bit pissed off that she was being questioned. So I made a mental note of this. I didn't really like the way she was acting. They asked her, was there anything out of the ordinary that happened around the time of her disappearance? And she drops a bombshell on detectives. She says, I know Kim was very upset, and my ex-husband, my husband, whatever you want to call him, we're not divorced yet. I guess Kim had contacted the police on September 13th, which would be 17 days before the disappearance, to report that Ronald, her husband, ex-husband, whatever, had done stuff to her and they were sleeping in the same bed and stuff and it was non-consensual and that's as far as details as she went into, but you guys can assume what happened there. Her best friend Destiny also accounts that Kim would act very different whenever Ronald was around. Like, she was clearly uncomfortable. So maybe this wasn't the first time this had happened. This could have just been the first time that she reported it. Heather refers to him as her stepfather, and she's saying now that the things he did was horrible and she wishes she could have done more, but unfortunately they couldn't at the time. Police arrest Ronald on September 19th, this would be 11 days before the disappearance, and he is charged with sexual assault on a child. So Ronald is now the number one suspect. My biggest question was, okay, if he was charged 11 days before, wouldn't he then be in jail? Ronald is now the number one suspect. He gets brought in for an interrogation. I was thinking, I'm like, this guy's not in prison. Wasn't he charged with sexual assault on a child? Why is he, why is he out? That was really weird to me. Maybe you guys know why. He's saying, none of this is true. My ex-wife is conspiring to cause me harm. With the sexual assault thing, he's saying that Kim, I'm sorry, he's saying that Laura, his ex-wife, talked Kim into falsely accusing him of this just to take him down. Like, this is all just some conspiracy by Laura. Sure. Sure, dude. 
He says that on the night of the disappearance, which would have been September 29th, he was with his biological daughter from September 29th to the 30th. His biological daughter did confirm this. Since his alibi checks out, officers let him go. I mean, don't you think maybe his biological daughter would lie for him? Like, she definitely would, but they let him go for now. Police start asking the public for some help. After some time passes, Kim's aunt calls in and she says she has some information that might help the case. She says she was concerned about an ex-boyfriend of Kimberly's, says that he told some people that if she ever dumped him, he would kill her. That's... That's pretty insane, and she does break up with him. So now police are like, well, we gotta, obviously we gotta go get this guy. So this dude's name is Matt, and Matt was working at a restaurant at the time. So officers go to his work and just question them there. They're like, what do you know about Kimberly's disappearance? And they start asking him questions. He does admit that he said all of those things. He was just angry, he was hurt, but that he didn't mean any of it. On September 30th, which would have been the day that she was killed, killed? Yeah, because she was missing, and like, what, missing? Okay, yeah. This would have been the day that she went missing. He was getting his learner's permit and the DMV has records for everything. So he brings up his permit and there was a timestamp with the date and time of when he got the permit. So that alibi checks out. It's a solid alibi, detectives say. And so they let him go. Forensics calls in about the chains found on the body. The chains were in relatively good shape for being in salt water. So this indicated that they were potentially new and recently purchased. The markings on it gave away the manufacturer. So detectives call manufacturer and the manufacturer tells them that they sell that particular chain to a department store called Lowe's, which I refer to as the bootleg Home Depot. They find a Lowe's a few miles from where Kim lives. The store is able to find a receipt that had that purchase of those chains plus the exact clamps that were found on Kimberly's body plus two cinder blocks and this purchase was made the morning of the disappearance. The store did have security cameras at the registers, so they pull the footage, and you guys, it's grainy as hell. I hate the security footages are so grainy because if we just invested a little bit of money, like each of us gave a dollar, we could just upgrade everything, but it is what it is, I guess. This video matches the date and time of the receipt. So this was the exact transaction, which means whoever purchased these items definitely had something to do with Kimberly's disappearance. There was two men that were purchasing the items. They needed to figure out who these two guys are. So they release images of the footage to the public. A few hours pass and somebody calls. This somebody says, hey, I'm one of those people in the picture. And this man's name was Robert Brothers. All right, so we got him, question mark? He goes in to talk to police and he was visibly afraid and he was just anxious to clear his name. He says, the other guy is Jacob Jones. Jacob called him, wanted to go to Lowe's to get some items to make an exercise device. Officers are not buying that Robert did not think this purchase was weird, which I'm gonna come to Robert's defense right now because if any of my friends or family said, hey, I'm gonna go to the store and buy cinder blocks and chains to exercise with i would be like okay whatever like i would go with them help them carry to the car i definitely wouldn't think it's super weird especially if i if i think or thought that i knew them well i'm just and it's as paranoid as i am about every little thing i really wouldn't think anything funny of that he's telling them other than that he doesn't know anything but he does tell officers to talk to jacob's girlfriend heather if that name does not sound familiar to you guys, or it does, it should, because we already talked about her. This is Kimberly's sister, foster sister. Now officers are thinking like, okay, clearly this is a connection. Like, obviously, was it a love triangle? Was it something that Jacob did behind her back? Is there some sort of family conspiracy? So they call Heather in for questioning, and she is hysterical. She's very upset to the point where she gets a nosebleed. Um, crying and answer the questions. I don't, I'd be that detective. Why are you crying? Stop crying. She tells officers that their relationship was going south and at one point Kim had taken her clothes and Heather was so pissed about it. So they had a verbal argument, which is such a sisterly thing to like get angry about. Like, ah, oh, you took my t-shirt. How dare you? And then 
it's just like a, it's not a big deal i mean the way heather talks about it in the interrogation tape or interview tape it looks like she's still pissed off which is like dude it's just clothes like relax it's not a big deal but that's what sisters fight over she's saying that kimberly needed help she's like i couldn't help my mother couldn't help from an outsider's perspective it looks like kim joined their household and kind of shook it up a little bit you know with the accusations i'm not saying she lied i i believe her 100 percent but it, if this family was happy, which I highly doubt Kimberly was the only reason this family was falling apart, if you will. Um, but yeah, it just seems like she, it looks like she's the root of the problems, even though that's I, I doubt that she's the only problem. In the interview, she's sticking to her story. She's like, I don't know anything. I don't even know if that's Jacob in the video, which come on, that's your boyfriend. You know, that's your you know, that's him in the video. Stop. Heather is saying in the documentary now that she was just as shocked as everyone else. She was in disbelief. She does say now that she did know it was him in the, in the uh, footage, but she was just in shock. Jacob seemed like an organized person. He was a sophomore at a university majoring in aerospace. He had a full ride scholarship. So why? The question that the detectives had was why is this guy going to mess everything up? Which I have two words, Aaron Hernandez that dude messed everything up and he had money he had like looks or whatever and he had like a child and a wife and he still went and did all that and he was 22 which is insane but this isn't about him i'm just proving a point that you can have your life quote unquote together and still be a murderer he also had a job at a local air base giving lessons as an instructor pilot guys remember the blunt force trauma could have been caused by falling at least five stories into open water we're getting something now they bring jacob in for his statement and they're telling him which is they tell him you're not under arrest you're being detained isn't that like kind of the same thing tell me if i'm wrong guys i mean this isn't a different state i know in california i'm pretty sure it's the same thing but he admits to being the person who bought the chains and he says the same thing i was gonna use it to work out and they ask okay how did you plan on what was the word that they used configuration what was your configuration with this and he's like uh i was gonna use the chains and the cinder blocks as like the weight after that there's no configuration like okay so you're just gonna pick something up and put it down i mean that's essentially what exercising and weightlifting is now that i say that out loud but anyway he seems really nervous he's talking kind of slow i'm not sure if it's because he's tired they tell him that this chain is the exact chain that was found on kimberly's body and he's saying it's a shock to me that you're saying it's the same chain eventually he asks for an attorney and after that they don't get much else at that point they did not have enough to charge him so they needed to keep working they go to the airbase where he worked and they talk to his supervisor his supervisor tells detectives that lately he's been acting a little weird like he's kind of flaky he's got anger issues not very consistent he was just distracted they ask him do you have flight records log books anything that could tell us where your planes go like any type of logging on the evening of september 30th according to the log books he took an airplane at 11:45 p.m and comes back at 1 50 a.m the next morning what do you think a person is doing between those hours especially on the night that somebody goes missing and their body is found in the ocean. There's also a flight pattern that goes over the exact spot that she was found. I'm very curious if you guys know the answer to this question. How would they know the exact flight pattern that an airplane takes? Is there some sort of tracking device on an airplane? I mean, I'm assuming that's what it is because how else would they know? But if you guys know and that's not the answer, please tell me because I'm curious. After this, they obtain an arrest warrant. Now they just gotta go put him in handcuffs. As they are going into his house, in his room, they find that he had committed suicide. He took a shotgun and shot himself in the skull. They're looking around the room. They see a detective's card on the table or the nightstand. And they also see that the TV was on. They're assuming that he was watching the news, starting to kind of feel overwhelmed, like the walls were coming in on him, like he was going to get caught, obviously. And he just took the shotgun and killed himself. His parents were home at the time. They start interviewing the parents and his father says, he told me what he did. So instead of leaving a suicide note, he left a confession with his father. I wonder if he was 
like religious maybe he thought this would clear him of his sins but suicide is also a sin so he killed kimberly with help from his friend michael kaiser which this name we have not heard at this point those two had known each other for about six years so now detectives have a name their witness is dead so they can't really ask him any more questions but they grab michael they bring him in to be interviewed it is now friday october 24th in 2003 Michael is 23 years old, which, to which I have to say, dude, what are you doing? You're literally helping your friend hide a body. Go to a bar. Like, this was before coronavirus. Go to a bar. Pick up some chicks. Do what, like, normal 23-year-old dudes are doing. Or Jacob told his father that you helped kill her, detectives say to Michael. He admits that he was there during the murder. He says that. Jacob called him up, said, hey, let's pick up Kimberly from her house. So he's like, yep, let's go. So it looks like, I think that they took Michael's car. So they went to pick up Kimberly. And that's when Jacob tells her, hey, we need to talk about this and these problems that you're having with Heather. And she's like, yeah, let's talk about it. I mean, she obviously wants to fix the relationship with her sister, which... To that I say, why not just talk to her yourself? Like if you're gonna have an intervention, have them both there. But that's not how it went. First they went to Wawa to get drinks. I don't, it looks like a liquor store from the security footage. And just Kim and Michael went into the store. Later on, they, I don't know where they end up. The documentary doesn't tell you exactly where they ended up, but in the dramatization, it looks like they ended up in like a hotel room or a motel room or something. Um, so she ends up going to the bathroom and that's when Jacob goes to Michael and he says, let's kill her. Like I need to kill her. And according to Michael, he says, if you don't help me, I'm going to kill you. And I'm watching the documentary. I'm like, oh my gosh, no way. Like that sucks. He's threatening you. Oh my God. And detectives are saying, no one believes this guy. Like there's no way he even believes himself. And I was just kind of sitting there like, I mean, I kind of believed him, but like, it's okay. I'm not a detective. So let's continue. Yeah, I couldn't be a detective. I'd just be questioning him and be like, yeah, no, I didn't kill her. Okay, you can go. Like, good thing I'm not. And I just talk about it. Detectives say, did he say why he wanted to do this? And this is what he said verbatim, guys. The only thing I knew is that everything at home with his girlfriend has been really rough because Heather couldn't do anything with Kim. Kim was always screaming at her or having guys over all the time, but he never told me why. Like, yeah, he kind of just told you why. It's not an excuse, not even... A little bit of an excuse uh, but he definitely told you why Michael he says he wanted to leave but like I said Jacob threatened that he would kill him she comes out of the bathroom and Jacob grabs her while Michael holds her down by her legs Jacob then grabs a phone cord and starts strangling her with it she eventually stops kicking and Jacob goes to feel her pulse and she was dead they then put her body into the trunk and there were even more items in the trunk detectives ended up finding out later on there was duct tape, there was rope, so this was premeditated, which we could have determined from the Lowe's receipt. Jacob rents a plane, puts Kim's body inside, takes off, flies over the ocean, and drops her body in. The impact must have, detectives say, disintegrated the cinder blocks. I'm not sure that it would have disintegrated it. I mean, actually, that's a pretty strong word. I wonder if it would be that powerful. That's what it's saying. But this left only the chains, which wouldn't be enough to sink her down. Michael is saying that he did not go onto the base, he did not go onto the plane, and he left as soon as he could. But, like, this guy's getting charged with first-degree murder regardless, but now he's just, like, full of Officers offer him a plea deal, and Michael did not want to take it, and he wants to go to trial. So clearly, the jury hears all of this, and he is found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Officers do not think Heather was a killer, but they definitely think that she knows more or knew more than she was admitting. Being interviewed now, she is saying that she agreed to the documentary to clear her name and basically stick to her story that she had no part in the murder of her foster sister. Um, she was also saying that, you know, people get angry and things get out of hand sometimes and things aren't fair and all that stuff. Detectives felt that Heather blamed Kimberly for breaking up her family. She confided in her boyfriend, Jacob, who then took it upon himself to come up with this plan where Kimberly ended up dead. That's, I have to agree. I also think that that's what happened. I mean, I'm seeing Heather being interviewed now, and do I believe her? I mean, yeah, 
yes and no because she would be on the documentary whether she had nothing to do with it or whether she did and she still wanted to clear her name you know i think she could have something on her conscience that she wants to release or make herself feel better but she could also be completely innocent i'm not sure how close her and her boyfriend were if if she was as close as me and my boyfriends have been boyfriends like i have a bunch right now um then they definitely she definitely knew what he was doing i i think i've always had a really close relationship with um, the people in my life to where they knew every everything check out the documentary guys let me know what you guys think that is it for today's uh, episode rest in peace to kimberly colton i'm positive you and i probably would have gotten along because you know animals and animals are cool we could watch animal shows together now i'm just talking out of my ass and being awkward (laughs) all right guys make sure you give us five stars wherever you're listening um patreon is on pause check out the sponsor audibletrial.com slash consuming crime for two free credits and that's pretty much it you'll hear me slash see me next week